So my family moved to northern Minnesota from Cornwall, England. This is actually a picture of the mine where my great-great-grandfather started working when he was a child. He was 11 years old when he went down in the mine. And then uh, he kind of grew up in the mines. And he, uh, this is the town of St. Agnes where my family is from in Cornwall. And I actually went back there and was working on a novel um, that's set in northern Minnesota. And while I was doing that, um, these are the mines in Sudan. So he emigrated from Cornwall to um, the UP of Michigan and then got to the North Shore, Duluth area, like 1878, 79, and then hiked over the Vermilion Trail to Lake Vermilion and started uh, laying away ore. And this is an interesting area because if you look here, you can see the Laurentian Divide. From that point north, all the rivers flow north. So when they hiked into this area, most of the United States had been cut for white pine, but not this area because they used the rivers to get the logs to the mills, and the mills were all downstream. So this was a little pocket. So they kind of walked into a wilderness up there. Um, this is it today. Uh, just as an aside, he got there. His wife and seven children followed him, arriving on Christmas Eve. Um, three months later, he was killed in the mine, and everybody was on their own. So uh, my great great grandfather ended up. Um, bought, you know, the family was still up there, and the land is still in the family that we have. Um, so this is wilderness, right? What we think of as wilderness, and so I had a college instructor when I was uh, getting my master's, and he would say, um, the question is more important than the answer. So I was raised in this area, and my grandmother was quite the ecologist, and she knew all the mushrooms. It drove my mother crazy, because we'd walk through the forest and just pick mushrooms and eat them, and she'd be like, oh, I don't know if those are any good, and berries, and herbs, and trees, and everything. And I grew up thinking that the Boundary Waters was a wilderness area, that it had been undeveloped and was kind of untouched. Um, and in the process of writing the book, I, I really, uh, a lot of my preconceptions were debunked. Um, and Minnesota is a really interesting place to study this because for logging, right, it began the way the pioneers did it. It began basically the way the Romans did it, using animals and chains and manual labor to cut the trees and get them to a mill. Um, and by the end of it, we had Frederick Weyerhaeuser, who had integrated the industry, controlling the supply, the transportation, the manufacture, and the retail. Um, and it all happened in the cutting of what is northeastern Minnesota. So th this is the Marshner map. This is a pretty special map. This guy Marshner went through all of the old survey notes that are currently at the Minnesota Historical Society. And I looked at these notes. Um, and they're kind of bent from being in somebody's back pocket. And they're stained. And they're still there. And they describe what they saw as they surveyed Minnesota. And if anybody's ever been to the Boundary Waters, when I was reading about that area, they were describing it as park-like. They were riding horses through northeastern Minnesota. There was elk and caribou and moose. There were woodland buffalo, right, in the Ely area, right? So I'm like, well, you know, I was like, this is totally different. What has changed? How, I, I could not reconcile what I was reading in these journals with what I had grown up with thinking was wilderness. Um, so this guy Marshner went and mapped every kind of forest type. And northern or Minnesota is interesting for, the, it, it, uh, for starters. It's halfway between the North Pole and the equator. So the storm that we're getting today that's fed by the Arctic air from the north and the moisture from the Gulf of Mexico and those kind of equatorial weather systems where we're right on the edge of rain and snow that's us. We're on the edge. 
It's also the only one of two places in the world, low elevation places in the world, where four uh, biomes overlap. A biome is an area of like vegetation that's continental in size. So what we've got is we've got the white pine forest type that kind of comes up over the Great Lakes. It starts on the East Coast in Maine, Pennsylvania, kind of comes through northern Ohio, uh, Vermont area, and it terminates about Cloquet. Kind of you can see sort of where it is. Um, and then we've got the boreal forest, which is the Arctic forest that comes from the North Pole all the way down. These are the birches and the aspen and the, and the balsam fir and the white spruce. And it terminates kind of about Cloquet. Um, then we've got the hardwood forest, little house in the big woods. Uh, there's a few remnant stands around here. Um, but those are the oaks and the elms and the silver maples, uh, big uh, hardwood trees that come kind of from uh, North Carolina in the Appalachian Mountains, the Big Smokies, and come through the south, through Illinois, up through Wisconsin, and terminate about Cloquet. And then we've got the arid west, the Great Plains, that come all the way from the Rocky Mountains and terminate about here. So this is a really key area to study. Because when you study Minnesota, what you're studying is edge. And so for climate change, right, if your biome is shifting because the weather is getting warmer and you're in the middle of Nebraska, you don't see any change. The weather's warmer, but the plants don't change because they're dead set in the middle of their biome. Minnesota, we're on edge. We're all edge. And so the changes that we're going to see here in the next 50 to 100 years are going to be more dynamic than only one other place in the entire world. So I'm just throwing that out there for you. Um, but it's really interesting in terms of diversity. This is a very, very uh, biologically diverse state. So here's kind of a map of all the biomes to sort of give you a, a bigger idea. And you can see where they all sort of meet in northern Minnesota. Um, this was the end of the white pine cut. They started cutting on the east coast and they cut all the way across. And this pocket of northeastern Minnesota was the last place cut. Logging has always been a migratory industry. Um, North Africa, so think Iraq and Iran, right? That was the Fertile Crescent. That was a rainforest. Its climate was very similar to the climate of Oregon. But it was cut again and again and again uh, for the Romans, and the Greeks cut it, and, and the Europeans cut it, and now it is what it is. Um, so it, I, I, I thought that was kind of fascinating. Um, and this was kind of the end of the frontier. By the time people got to northeastern Minnesota, it was in that 1860s era, just after the Civil War. Um, and it was sort of the end of the frontier. And a lot of our frontier ideas were shifting at that time period. So like the land, um, sort of the politics and the social science and uh, psychology of Americans, when this was happening in the Boundary Waters, were during a period of dramatic change. There was a big shift. Um, so these are the loggers. And they came mostly from Maine. That's why a lot of towns here have Maine names. Uh, they worked from before sunup to before sundown. There were no thermometers allowed in camp because they didn't want them to know how cold it was. Um, they could have as much food as they wanted, and the food was really, really good because that was kind of the one benefit. Otherwise, they worked for about a buck a day, right? Um, and what would happen a lot is, you know, farmers from the Dakotas that had teams of horses, well, they'd be teamsters, so they'd bring their plow horses in to run, work in the logging camps in the wintertime. <coughs> um, other people were just kind of itinerant, you know, um, worked the logging camps. This is a uh, ice sled. So how they moved the logs was on ice. So they would, in the summers, they would swamp out a trail in an area they were going to cut. And then when it began to snow, they had a sled that came by that um, kind of plowed and packed the snow down. Then they would run this sled, and they would take it out onto the uh, ice and use barrels and cross-haul barrels of water, and they would fill it up, 
And then here at the back end, they had little kerosene uh, lamps above sprinklers. So they had the lamps to keep it from freezing and they would sprinkle this road down. Uh, and then they had an ice cutter that came by and it was like two planes on rails that would actually shave tracks in the ice so the sleds couldn't slide one way or the other. So they were like inverse rails and they moved enormous amounts of weight with these sleds, right? Um, and look at the size of those trees. I've saw pictures of people looking at the trees in northern Minnesota and they would cut them in a plank and the guy was like this and the plank was wider than his outstretched arms. So six, eight feet in diameter, the trees in northern Minnesota when they were cut were four to 800 years old. There was more lumber in the area from Duluth north to the Canadian border standing than in the Olympic Peninsula in uh, Washington. A huge amount of trees. So now this is a few years later. This picture is older and you can see the logs are starting to get smaller. They started with the first, uh, the big logs first, and then they worked their way down. And there they're even smaller still. Now we're starting to get into the pulp, pulp cut. Um, so when I first started, I thought, well, this is a big deal. They, they cut all these trees down. Um, this was the pre-settlement distribution of forest in what is basically the white pine belt. And that's post. This aspen birch. So this is pre-cut. You can see the dark green pine forest and barrens, northern Mes uh, Mesiac forest, um, and the boreal forest and conifer swamp. So think uh, black spruce for that. That's pre, and this is post. Right? So we have a much different landscape than we had pre settlement. I thought this was the story. I'm writing my book and I'm like, well, what's the you know, ecological impacts of that? And I'm asking everybody about this forest succession stuff. And um, here's another slide that shows kind of pre-settlement forest and post-settlement forest. And it's uh, dramatically different now. So I went to see a slideshow uh, done by uh, some kids that paddled to Hudson Bay from Ely. And there was this guy there, this little guy, um, and I told him about the book, and I told him about all the trees got cut down, and uh, how, what the, what, how significant that was, and he said, no, 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 that doesn't matter at all. And I said, well, what do you mean? They, they cut all the trees, I mean, it's totally different now. And he goes, yeah, that doesn't matter. He goes, the key is fire. Fire's the thing. And I'm thinking, fire? What, what is this guy talking about? He was the guy, his name is uh, uh, Buzz. Um, oh, now I'm forgetting it. I'll remember it. But he's the guy who gave me the first copy of the Marshner map. You know, um, And he was like, fire is the thing. Fire is the driver. Fire is the reason why the forest is the way it is. Um, and fire had a big impact in northern Minnesota and in the rest of the country. So we're cutting, right? And after we cut, they take all the branches off and they leave the tops and they take the logs away and there's all this stuff on the ground. Uh, and then young stuff comes up, little trees, right? And anybody who's ever dealt with a campfire knows if you throw a bunch of little sticks on a fire, it flares up. If you throw a big round log on a fire, it goes out. Young forests burn hotter and faster than old forests do, right? So the forests that were in Wisconsin after the cut of the white pine there were really flammable. This is the Peshtigo fire. Um, it hit Green Bay, and on the shores of Green Bay were lumber yards with boards stacked up, and when the when the people in the town saw the fires coming, they jumped on boats and they sailed out into Lake Michigan. They were seven miles out in the lake and, and burning planks were raining down on the deck of the ship, right? And this was in like a day, 
an area this size burned. The next one was, and, and when the first logs were cut, so I said there's all that wood from Duluth North, well, like 98% of that was just cut. It wasn't sold. It wasn't, um, you know, no one had rights to it. They just got in there and they cut it. Um, and how many people pay property taxes? Okay, so we pay property taxes today to cover the cost of that theft. When the federal government ceded the land to create the state of Minnesota, Section 6 and 36 in every township were set aside to pay for school funds. And the idea was, and it was a good idea, the state would sell the trees, get the money, put it in a reserve account, and pay for education. Well, that was completely, they never got a dime. Because the loggers would come in and they knew, well, Section 6 and 36, there'd be no settler there. They cut those first and just took the trees. So we're all paying property tax to cover the theft of trees 100 years ago. I'm a little resentful <laughs> every time I write the check. So this fire came in. Then there was the Hinckley fire. And this was 800 people killed at least. Um, this burned four hours. The intensity of the fire was about four hours. So I couldn't wrap my head around this, so I started doing some fire science. And what it is, is it's a plume-dominated fire. So imagine a temperature inversion, right? Hot day. This fire was the same day as the Chicago fire, by the way. Um, and you get a fire going that's got enough fuel to create enough energy to punch through that inversion layer. Well, now you've got cold air rushing down. You've got the hot air rushing up and the whole thing blows up, right? And instead of a fire front moving like this, as you typically think, like a line, this is a circle. So it goes one acres, two acres, four acres, eight acres, 16, moves like this. Uh, creates its own weather patterns. Winds up to 150 mile an hour race off this thing and you got it, the convection is sucking up, so it's sucking everything up and blowing it out the top, um, and it was raining down miles away. It's brimstone. It's biblical. It's a naturally occurring weather event that happens when you've got too much fuel in the forest. So just put a pin in that idea. I thought fire was, you know, my, my ideas around fire evolved. Fire is a weather event, like snow, like rain, like a bright sunny day. So what was our response to this? We had been trying to get forestry. People like Givert Pinchot are like, whoa, you know, we need to have professional forestry and treat trees like a crop and we can raise them to be grown and it can be a sustainable harvest and all of these ideas that we've become so comfortable with. Ran into intense opposition until these two fires and all these people were killed and then People were like, yes, we're ready for forestry. We don't want any more people to die. So the Forest Service, with the CCC camps, basically covered the entire country, continental United States. They built roads for access. They built fire towers. The first phone lines in the country that were strung intercontinentally were strung between fire towers. Then after the Korean War, we took all this military surplus and training, put that at the fire. So we had smoke jumpers. If someone in a fire tower saw a fire, the goal of the Forest Service was, and still is, to put that fire out by 10 o'clock a.m. the following morning. And so they would see a spot of smoke, and they would send a plane up, and if they couldn't get to it by road, people would parachute in and put the fire out. Uh, 1941, we have Smokey the Bear. Probably the most uh, effective marketing campaign that's ever been developed. Uh, had very strong patriotic undertones, right? During the war. Protect the resource. Two years later, Bambi comes out, right? And fire on our landscape is universally seen as only destructive and bad. And the only solution for a fire in our mindset at that time is put it out. Put them out, put them all out, 
They're bad. They kill Bambi. So here's the wilderness. Um, and these trees are fire dependent. White pine doesn't grow without fire. It can't advance its range without fire. And if you look at, well, here, I'll keep going here. Um, and we had this idea, oh, let me back up a minute. So then in the 60s, 50s, 60s, um, the Forest Service hires this guy, Arthur Carhart, who is a landscape architect. And they hire him to paddle in the Boundary Waters Wilderness Area and find places to put cabins. Because they're going to lease cabin sites to people within the Boundary Waters. The Boundary Waters at that time had a whiskey distillery up there. There were railroads all through the Boundary Waters. There were roads all through the Boundary Waters. It was the largest seaplane base in the world. There was a lot going on up there. There were general stores. There were little towns. There were little villages. There was a potato farm up by American Point. A lot of activity. But a lot of it was national forest as well. So he paddled through the Boundary Waters. And an interesting thing happened to him. He had a spiritual experience. He came to the realization that human beings needed to be in places where they couldn't see the works of humans. They needed to be in natural environments or something was lost. And so he came back and he told his supervisor, right? And all these guys in the Forest Service, they're like ex-military. I mean, they're very practical, get her done kind of people. And he goes, you know, I had this experience in the Boundary Waters and I think really the utility of the place rests in its lack of development. And I think that if we put cabins everywhere and roads everywhere, we're gonna wreck the joint. And the Forest Supervisor said, huh, that's an interesting idea. I'll sit on it. So they didn't develop the Boundary Waters. At the same time, a guy named Aldo Leopold was in the Gila Wilderness in Colorado, and he had the same experience, right? He was like two weeks in the Gila Wilderness hunting, and he had this emotional response. But Aldo Leopold was a good writer, so he started writing about it. And so other people heard about it. And then he and Carhart met, and they started working to create wilderness areas in the United States. Boundary Waters Wilderness Area is the first wilderness area that was created in the world. Right? Minnesotan Hubert Humphrey was one of the people who pushed it, one of the lead shepherds of it. And this is an interesting demo. Uh, Wilderness is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man. Well, the Boundary Waters was pretty significantly trammeled. You saw the pictures of the number of trees that were cut up there, right? So, kind of an interesting thing, but I, I get what they're going for, and it, it's kind of wonderful. Um, but I began to wonder if it was accurate. We removed the pine. We reduced the number of forest fires and acres burned. Uh, the fires now are hotter and more intense. We increased grazing through introducing deer to the area. So by this time, right, there's no caribou, there's no elk, the buffalo are gone, there's still some moose, there's a ton of deer. They eat different plants than elk and moose and buffalo eat. So now the thing is set on a different trajectory in terms of how it evolves over time. Um, and we turn the area into a designated wilderness. We put a wall around it. And with regard to fire, we did an interesting thing. We said, well, because of this rule, if there's a lightning strike and the fire starts, we're going to let it burn, because that's natural. If it's a man-made fire, somebody has a campfire, is careless with a cigarette, well, then we'll put it out, because that's an unnatural fire, according to the rules of the Wilderness Act. Um, so here's Buzz, and I, I still can't remember his last name, but he got interested in fire, and they didn't get every tree. They couldn't get to every little stand. The largest stand I found was about 14 acres, and the trees were about five, 600 years old. They missed little pockets. 
Um, and so Buzz went around, and you can see the fire scars on this top log. And he dated the fires to see what the fire was like. So now at this point, with our, they called it the wildland fire use rule, right? We're putting out man-made fires and letting natural fires burn. And within what is now the boundary waters, we have about 1,200 acres a year that's burning. Okay. Buzz does his research, and he maps it all out, the boundary waters. And this is the outline of the boundary waters here, of what is now the boundary waters wilderness area. And the areas are areas of fire. So those are 1610 to 1692. And as you go through time, you can see the whole thing was burning. Right? This area right here was an area of really dense white pine, high value. The record was lost there. Right? This, this area is the area that was logged intensively. And there was nothing left. Um, so we don't have a record for that. But Buzz finds out that pre-settlement, before white people got to the area, 12,000 acres a year were burning in the Boundary Waters. That fire moved over any given square inch of land in the Boundary Waters once every 30 years. Huh. So on one hand, we've got 1,200 acres letting naturally caused fires burn. And pre-settlement, we've got 12,000 acres. So I'm working on the book, and uh, my second daughter is born, and it's about a month before it's uh, due to be published, to come out in print. And I call the editor at the Minnesota Historical Society, and I say, I've got this problem, right? I've got this discrepancy that I don't know how to resolve. And um, she says, oh, well, okay. And I say, I, I think fire might be a bigger part of the story than we imagined. She says, well, okay, that's good. You dig into it and fix whatever you want. And I said, well, can we push the publishing date back? She said, oh, well, no, we can't do that. Right? So I got a new baby, and she, Daisy, my daughter Daisy, was like, you know, three weeks old. <coughs> And I have to tell my wife that I need to be at the Historical Society looking at fire data. Um, she was very kind about it. <laughs> so then another thing happens in the Boundary Waters. We have this derecho, that wind that came through. And that was really in um, 1999 on July 4th. And I was actually out on an island in the Boundary Waters picking blueberries when this storm hit. It was unbelievable. Um, and it blew down tens, twenties, thirties, a hundred thousand acres of trees. And here's something to note. It blew down the trees in the areas that had been logged intensively. You know? So the trees had grown up, they were about 70 years old, the big wind came through and they all blew down. The ones that were older, that were in sort of mixed stands, mixed age classes, kind of uneven, you know, old trees and young trees, um, they didn't blow down. This is a picture of it here. But what we got now is we've got the largest bonfire in the world just waiting for a match, right? So when we talk about that plume-dominated fire, you need enough fuel and a fire hot enough to punch through the inversion layer, and then you get something that's really dangerous. So the Forest Service had to deal with this. They had to break their law and go back in and, and use, they actually firebombed it. They've got these like ping pong balls that are basically filled with dish soap and diesel fuel. Because the dish soap makes the diesel fuel kind of goopy. Right? And then they set these things on fire and they throw them out of helicopters and burn specific areas and get fires going. So they broke up the fuel load so that a really big fire couldn't get going. So the thing that we've changed, right? I, I, I'm, I'm working on this discrepancy. 12,000 acres burning pre-settlement, 
1,200 acres burning post-settlement? And the answer was anthropomorphic fire. The Native Americans that lived in this area before us set fires. They burned all the time. The forests that we encountered when we got here were not a cultural, were not like a steady state ecosystem in balance with itself. They were a cultural artifact of a people that managed a landscape for the benefits they wanted, buffalo, elk, caribou, moose, blueberries, birch trees, and they did it with fire. So, and the other thing I learned, uh, and I don't know if you've read any of these, I was like, well, how could these just few people really do all this? Well, there wasn't just a few. The disease, the rates of die-off from European diseases were very, very high, 9 out of 10. When Columbus landed in the New World, the population of the New World was higher than the population of Europe at the same time. When they came back, many, many people had died, and so they didn't see anybody. And we didn't get what they were doing, right? Because we're coming from Europe, and if we walk into a landscape that people have been managing, we expect to see a few things. We expect to see fence rows, right? But the Indians had no private ownership of land. They managed on a landscape scale. We expect to see barns, but they didn't use barns. They used fire, right? We, we, we expected to see civilization, and, and we didn't find that. Um, so we thought that nobody had been here, right? But that was the difference in fire. So the Indians were burning all the time. In the fall, they would set the Great Plains on fire and drive all the buffalo south, and they would follow them south. And then in the spring, they would set the Great Plains, the grasslands on fire in the south, drive the buffalo up north, and the buffalo would get there, and it would be all this new fresh grass coming up from the year before. Right? And they just moved the herds around like that. Right? So I was like, huh. And the consequence of what, how we've been managing our forests is this. So where low severity fires, low ground fires, just kind of creeping along through the woods, were the norm, now they're the exception. I read one journal from a voyageur, an English guy, um, and he was complaining in the journal about having to resole his moccasins because they crossed so many fires that day. Right? So fires that you can run through, not fires that are so hot they corkscrew train tracks and rain burning planks down on ships seven miles out in the water. Right? And here's what's happening with fire. 1885, we're spending, you know, a couple million dollars a year on fire in the United States. And there's where we are now. One big piece is climate change. We first started to see the impacts in the 80s. Another big piece is our forest management strategy and policies regarding fire. Smokey the bear. The idea that all fires are bad. Here are the acres a year. Um, if you graph the number of deaths, it's even more terrifying, so I just don't include it, right? But for all of these spikes, there's a lot of people dying. And homes being destroyed. But this is interesting, right? So here's this whole neighborhood that's been destroyed, except for, look at this house. Right? One house survives. The whole neighborhood goes, one house survives. So I asked the question, why? Why did all the other houses burn except for that one? The newspaper called it a miracle house. Maybe. Um, but maybe there's another reason, too, besides good living. So this was taken by a friend of mine who's a smoke jumper. And they got to this house as this fire was raging, and they had one of these, I don't know, you probably buy them at the stores here in town, these like raffia wreaths that you hang on the door of your cabin, and there was a broom leaning next to the front door. 
you know, so people sweep out the cabin and then they set the broom on the front porch and they go. The broom and the wreath were on fire when they got to the house. So the smoke jumper just took those two things and threw them out in the yard. Meanwhile, the fire's raging towards the house and the house survived. Right? Fire is like a, um, oh wait. So there's this guy, Jack Cohen, and he did these fire experiments. These are the little smoke jumping houses that the smoke jumpers and firefighters try and survive in. Here's all these instruments. They took an area of the Northwest Territories and would cut out big plots and build fire breaks all around the plot, and then they would set them on fire and do experiments. And here is a video of one of those experiments, if it will play. Hmm, it's being a little wonky on this one. Uh, I don't think it's going to play on this machine. Anyways, they had a camera. They built a, a fake house 33 feet from, let me go back, 33 feet out from this flame front. So about right here. They built like a wall and a section of roof, and then they ran this fire at it. And the facade of this fake house started to smoke and a little bit of flame came up on it and then it went out. High intensity fire like this, the high temperatures, the spike temperature of one of these fires is 63 seconds. So if it doesn't start it on fire in 63 seconds, you're good. And fire literally moves, not, it moves by heat, right? So you've got one branch here, one branch here, and they're very close together. Well, this one starts burning. And this one heats up, and it starts to give off gas. And the gas ignites. And then because there's a fuel there, it catches. So if you break that, it doesn't catch. So that house was not a miracle house. It was a house that had nothing flammable on the outside of it, right? Because there's firebrands coming down. And it was at least 33 feet from the flame front. So it didn't catch fire. So if you have a cabin in northern Minnesota and you got trees hanging over your house, I'd get rid of them. And I'd keep things about 33 feet back from the side of your house. And then you would be OK, right? Because fire is a weather event. It's not when, it's not if there's going to be a fire near the cabin in northern Minnesota. It's when. The forest will burn. They do that, right? We can't stop it. Those earlier graphs were a demonstration of that. So we put roofs on our houses to prevent the rain from falling in, and we put gutters to keep the rain away from the foundation, and we rake them to get the snow off, and we should move all flammable vegetation 33 feet back from the edges of our buildings, right? To protect it for weather. So here's another experiment they did. This is the forest pre-treatment, right? And then at the top, they went in and they removed some of the trees. And they created spacing, right? And then they set it on fire. And here's the fire starting out on the top, and it starts on the ground, and it climbs up to the, tr to the crown, right? And then once it's in the crown where the winds are heavier, it starts to move. And it races through the stand and it gets to this spot, which is right at the edge of where they started to thin, and it falls back down to the ground again. And there's the stand. The fire didn't take. The fire didn't burn this part of the stand. The other part was level. This part didn't burn. Here's another fire. This is the Hayman Fire in Cal Colorado, right outside Denver. You might have heard out of it on the news some years ago, and they were afraid that it was going to go into Denver. It was a woman who was a forest ranger, and she was sad because her boyfriend broke up with her. So she burned all of her love letters in a fire grate. 
and the wind blew them into the brush right here. And this thing starts burning. And it is racing down this canyon, and Denver is in the top right-hand corner of this building, or of this photograph. Um, but it got to this area here. And this was this guy, Jack Cohen, who was the fire marshal for Arapahoe County. And he was concerned about the, the density of the forest. And so he did a prescribed burn in that area. And it created so much smoke and so many people complained about it down in Denver that he was forced to put it out. They went in and put it out. So that's what he did. But the idea here, right, is that you know, we have the smoke jumpers come in, and now we're at the point where we actually have sensors scattered all across the country. And they record every lightning strike that hits the ground. And there's a big map at the Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho, of the entire United States. And anytime lightning hits the ground, there's a red light pops up on the map. They load smoke jumpers into a plane. They fly over it. They look down. If there's trees burning, they jump out and they put them out. Except when they can't. Right? When it's too hot and too dry and too windy and they look down and even after that short amount of time the fire is just raging and then they've got a wildfire. So our fire policy right now in the United States is actively selecting for fires that burn only under the worst possible situation. If it's not the worst possible situation, we, we get them out. But we can't get them all out. Right? So that's what was making this guy Jack Cohen nervous, was these fuel loads are building, and he was worried about Denver. So he, he did a prescribed burn. He burned when it was, you know, 60% humidity instead of 10. He burned when the winds were less than 10 miles an hour instead of 30 or 40, right? And this big fire hit that area, and it stopped it. And save Denver. This is the area that got burned by the high intensity fire. This is the area that he prescribed burned. So prescribed burn doesn't kill every tree, right? It's going along the ground, it's cleaning out other stuff. Um, more like the way the Native Americans used to burn. Um, and then this is the Man Gulch fire. Um, and this is where we actually learned about this. So there was a fire, and the smoke jumpers came in. And you can kind of see their progress. And then there was a wind change. And they were down at the bottom here. And the fire was racing up the canyon. And they started running. And uh, 13 of them died in the fire. One guy survived. And he survived by. He saw the fire coming, and he was the leader. And so he started a fire in the grass, and he fanned it. And he burned out an area about the size of the stage. And then he laid down in the middle of it, buried his face in the dirt. And the fire got to him and went around him, and he was saved. The fire was so loud, he couldn't get the other people to come in to his black area. And there they are um, taking um, the victims out. But here's the Native Americans doing that exact same thing. So I read this account, and it's on the Great Plains, and the wagon train's going across, and the Native Americans are out there, and a big fire starts coming. You can see the smoke, and the wagon train people are freaking out, right? The fire's coming. And they grab their blankets, and they grab their water, and they circle the wagons. And the Native Americans are standing there watching them going, well, what are they doing? Right? And then they, they build a fire in the grass, they flame it for a while, and they burn out an area about the size of this room, and then they stand in the middle of it. And the fire comes, and there's no fuel, and it goes around them, and then kills all the people in the wagon train. Right? Our ideas about fire and our ideas about wilderness do not reflect the realities, the physics, even. But these people, they got it. There was a, a guy and a uh, young forester that had just been trained, and he was out in California. 
And he arrested a Native American elder for setting a fire in what is now Berkeley. And he wrote this letter saying, well, you know, now that we can get the savages and you know, their barbaric practices of destroying resources and blah, 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 well, the Native American guy was like, well, we've always done this. We have to do this. If we don't do this, we're all going to get killed because everything's going to grow up and then we'll have this big, huge fire that's just going to burn everything up. Berkeley uh, burned in 96, I believe. 183 people died. Whole neighborhoods were destroyed. So this will make the point. Right after the National Forest was created, this is what tribal fire regimes looked like on the landscape. This is what the Boundary Waters was probably kind of like. Big trees. Repeated fires coming through, taking out the smaller trees. This is the same forest 48 years later with our fire policies. And there's the same shot today. This is going to burn. This is what the boundary waters kind of looks like now, right? That's a problem. This is pretty nice. And there's the horse. So I'm reading about these guys riding horses through the boundary waters and unable to imagine how that would happen. And then I come across these three photos. You can never get a horse through that, right? So I named the book Forest for the Trees because I started out thinking I kind of understood what the Boundary Waters was like, right? Like my ancestors settled that place. And I learned from them. I had no idea. I'd looked at this place my entire life and I was blind to it until I started to dig into it. Um, so this was a teacher that I had in college. Um, and this is one of his quotes. And this resonates with me. And um, what I find really interesting about Minnesota is the research and the ideas, this evolution of ideas from pioneer logging, from tribal fire regimes, pioneer logging, creation of the Forest Service after the Hinckley Fire, creation of wilderness areas as a way to protect some areas, um, and then the following fire research and a lot of climate change research impacts on forestry is all coming from Minnesota. We're leading the world in understanding this stuff. So I think we're in a good position to make change. And so that's my hopeful note at the end. Um, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, question to you, you talked about the pre-settlement tribal um, fires and things. What, what was the evidence that you found of those practices? Well, there was the gap in you know, the difference between the fires that we have now, naturally in the Boundary Waters, and the fires after, um, the distribution of plant species. So like um, jack pine produces a cone that's coated in a resin that will only open under intense fire conditions, right? And so there was jack pine growing in areas that were logged because there was this intense fire activity, but there were scattered individual jack pines, really, really old in other parts of the forest that hadn't um, popped and started to grow seedlings. And we knew from the fire scars on the trees that fire had moved through those areas, but it was the low intensity fire, not the high intensity fire. Um, uh, there was a, Buzz did a lot of the work on it. Have you ever read the book, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I have some of the, uh, uh, Bud Heinzelman was his name. And then some of the other stuff is here if you want to see the sources. Um, Bud's a really good place to start though. That book is excellent. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Can you speak a little bit to the climate change? What are your colleagues saying about Minnesota? So it affects different things differently. 
right? And we know a lot about the impacts of increased rain. So we're getting about three inches more precipitation a year now than we were historically. Um, but it's coming now. It's coming in late winter, early spring. It's not coming in July and August. So that's going to have a big impact on agriculture, right? It's also coming in pulses. We're getting a ton all at once. So it's rushing off the landscape. So even in the land of 10,000 lakes, our aquifers are falling, even though we're getting more than three inches of rain, three inches more rain a year. This obviously has big impacts on uh, city infrastructure, so like Duluth. We've seen that, and Minneapolis is kind of all over this. Um, forestry is very, very concerned because we've been actively managing for aspen in this state since we cleared out the white pine. That was our solution, right? We'll just convert to aspen. It grows back really quickly. We'll build particle board and laminates. All of our mills are to that. But we've been actively managing for a forest type that's already retreated about 150 miles north. So the aspen in Minnesota is not long for this world, right? So it's going to have a big impact there. Um, and I just think it's amazing. Like, I walked through the woods on an island in northern Minnesota uh, adjacent to the Boundary Waters. I got maple trees coming up everywhere, right? I got oaks. Never seen an oak tree. Never. I got oak seedlings coming up in northern Minnesota. All kinds of stuff is changing. I mean, we don't really see it unless you know the plants, but it's dramatic. Um, so forestry, it'll be a big deal. Agriculture, it's going to be a big deal. Uh, I don't really know what the impact is going to be on lakes, uh, which is my area, because nobody really knows. A, lakes are very complex. Uh, and B, there isn't a um, strong central interest in asking the question what's the future going to be like, right? The farmers want to know what's coming down the road. So farm bureaus and stuff have been investing a lot of money in doing that work. Uh, for timber industry wants to know what's coming down the road, so they've been investigating. But lake industry is like kind of all of us, having a lake place or a couple of resorts, and you know people go fishing. It's not a concentrated thing, so we really don't know and actually, our group, uh, Minnesota Lakes and Rivers, is working on pulling together a conference. We've got scientists from around the world. I think it'll be in a year and a half. We're going to bring them in and, and ask the questions, decide which questions to ask first. Then let people do their work, and then come back, see what we learned, ask more questions. But I suspect that plants in lakes are going to become more abundant. I think that we will lose most of our walleye. I think that we will probably lose the northern pike. I think aquatic invasive species are going to be much more of an issue because as the water gets warmer, there's going to be a lot more species that can survive up here. Um, you know, human health issues are huge with the ticks and all this stuff. Um, yeah, it's going to be different. You said that there were two places in the world when you first started. Yes. What is the other one? It's in India, and I've forgotten the name of it. Yeah. Kind of where the mountains and the plains and the coastal region. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, I'm a little confused. I thought that the current fire forestry uh, plan was to clean clean out the forest. I mean, do some fire prevention by lighting control fires and cleaning out the bottom. Now, I got the impression that that's not the case. It, it is. And there's some efforts being done, like the one in Colorado. But the problem is, is budget. If you want to do prescribed burns, it comes out of the Forest Service budget. Once a fire is burning, Congress just opens the checkbook. I mean, these fires are, you know, well, you saw how expensive they are. It's billions and billions of dollars. 
all those people, they need water and they need batteries and they need tents to sleep in and helicopters and scoop planes and bulldozers and the whole thing, you know. That's not on the Forest Service budget. That's coming directly from the general, from the treasury. But if they want to schedule prescribed burns, they have to pull money from somewhere else in their budget and begin to do that work. And for a while they were trying to do, use logging, right? But the economics of logging are such that the loggers really want to just cut them all. You know, getting into the woods and picking around in there, that's expensive. Um, and logging makes fires more intense because you get those single species that are all at the same age group. They're more vulnerable to wind and disease and they burn better. So we don't have a really great, and if you have a, a stand of large old trees like in that other picture, like, um, like this stuff here, you can't sell that. Well, you can't, what do you sell it for? Right? So you can't log it. We actually, my wife and I and daughters had a uh, organic free range Christmas tree business. And we would go into people's property and remove all these trees and sell them as organic free range Christmas trees at shops in downtown Minneapolis. And uh, we were doing like 12,000 trees a year. But I got old and I can't carry a chainsaw all day. And we're done. But I couldn't. I, I can't think of anything you can sell this for. So it's it's a tough problem. But they are doing more prescribed burns. Um, they are letting more things burn. There's definitely a movement towards that. But it's it needs to be like a rallying call rather than a. Do you have any questions? From an ad, from the, that's a current perspective, then we're. Spending a lot on putting them out, not much on prevention. Yes. And, and I suspect it will start changing. And this is a terrible thing to say. But last time the change happened in Peshtigo and Hinckley, and it was over a thousand people were killed. I think it was 80 people died in paradise last year. And I would like to think that, that their deaths meant something and it was enough to, con you know, convince us that we need to make a, a radical departure in the way we manage our forests doesn't appear to have been. Rakes are not going to solve the problem. You know, so until something happens at such a scale that's so horrifying that people respond to it, we might be stuck. On that note, thank you.